Lord Jesus Christ, as you were born to establish your kingdom, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to us now and overthrow our own kingdoms, that you might rule and reign not only over us here, but that your kingdom would extend over all the earth. We pray that you'd even use humble means to do this. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please feel free to take your seats. Those of you who are knowledgeable of the history of World War II will know of Operation Overlord. If you don't know it by that name, that was the code name given to the invasions that happened on D-Day where Allied troops stormed the beaches of France in order to recapture Europe from uh, the regime of Hitler. But, but prior to that operation was an operation known as Operation Bodyguard. And, and, and this one's a little bit less well known, but every bit is important. You see, Operation Bodyguard began in 1943, and it was the Allied, uh, the Allied operation, uh, not, not necessarily a, a, an operation of military force, but an operation of information. And, and it was in this operation that, that, that the Allies worked to get misinformation into the hands of the Nazi military officials so that they would not be aware of either when or where the great invasion was coming. And so because of this operation, the Germans and uh, the, the Nazi regime did not know. They, they expected for the invasion to happen much later. Uh, they, they, they expected for the invasion to happen somewhere between Norway and southern France. Which is, I mean, if, I don't know if you've seen a map, but that's big. That's a big swath of territory to protect from troops storming your beaches. And, and, and they did this by several means. They did this by, by infiltrating with secret agents. They did it by turning uh, German agents into double secret agents. They did so by, by, by creating false um, armies you know they had big you may have seen these big huge inflatable tanks that they had set up so that so the 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 Nazi intelligence wouldn't know exactly where the armies were staging to get ready for this invasion and it was so successful that that when when the beaches of Normandy were stormed Hitler was so convinced that this was just a diversionary tactic that he didn't send reinforcements to help stop that invasion for seven weeks you see, it was, be, it was because he did not know when or where or how the invasion would come that would topple his kingdom that the Allied forces were able to do so. I bring that up because it is Christmas today. It's not Christmas Day, but it is Christmas today. And I don't do this very often because, you know, live and let live and all that. But I will say, you know, if we relegate our celebration of, you know, when we talk about the 12 days of Christmas, we're on like, I think we're on 10 lords a-leaping or 11 ladies dancing today. That's not 12 days beforehand, it's 12 days afterwards. And, and here's why I think this is helpful. When we had Christmas morning at our house, our children woke up and they dove into a smorgasbord of presents. That was largely over by about 10 or 11. And when we left the house, it was springtime outside. Every, 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 everything that said that it was Christmas time was gone. Why? Because there was no more money to be made off of it, right? I mean, right? The, it's time to start advertising for Valentine's Day now. Christmas is over. And here's the thing. If you relegate your celebration of Christmas to the one day that people are able to make profit off of, then your entire celebration of Christmas will all... It, it's just going to be, a, that's what it'll be about. It'll be about that kind of commercialism and that. Now that, that, I'm not saying that everybody should do this, but we keep, this is why we keep 12 days of Christmas. That's why we continue to celebrate Christmas when the world has packed it away and put it back up in the attic. And so today is Christmas and historically Christmas Day was the celebration of the event of Jesus' birth. The Sunday after that was the celebration of, of, the, of, of, of the reality of Jesus' divinity. And the second Sunday of Christmas, which is today, is a celebration of Jesus' humanity. And Jesus' humanity, the, the humanity of the divine word, the enfleshment of God, was an invasion 
that nobody expected. We just read about, about uh, Jesus having to flee from Herod and his, uh, and his attempts to extinguish the life of Jesus. And, and in this section, and, it, and it'll be helpful for you if you turn here uh, to Matthew chapter 2, I believe it's page 808 of your pew Bible, but in this section, Matthew gives us no fewer than three explicit, explicit fulfillments that he sees of Old Testament prophecy. He tells us at the beginning there in in 13 through 15, and and in verse 15, he says that all of this, Jesus is having to leave Bethlehem and flee to Egypt. He says, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. In, in, In 17 and 18, he says, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, and this is about those children who were slaughtered by Herod because Herod was so fearful that the child that was born in Bethlehem would become a rival claimant to his throne. And, and, and Matthew says, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they're no more. And then in verse 23, we read, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth that was, was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, if you read those, and if you don't have any knowledge of the Old Testament, or if you don't really know exactly where these things come from, you might read those and think that maybe somewhere, you know, there was a great, I don't know, maybe it was like at the county fair somewhere, and there's a fortune teller, and, you know, somebody paid it, and they read their palm. This is how the king is going to come. When the king comes, he's, he's going to... He's going he's gonna, to uh, he's gonna come out of Egypt. He's going to have to flee like a refugee. And, and, and children are going to be slaughtered around his birth. And he's going to grow up in Nazareth. But if you actually go back and read the references that Matthew's pointing to in the Old Testament, you find something very strange and very mysterious. And, and, and what, you'll find, what you'll find is a point that Matthew is trying to make. And the point that tra- Matthew is trying to make is really simply this. That the kingdom of God never comes the way that you expect it. The kingdom of God never comes the way you can. In in fact, you can expect for the kingdom of God to come in a way that you don't expect it. Right? Did you you follow that? Even, I mean, you know what, what, what's really interesting, if you, if you read Matthew chapter 1, what's really interesting in Matthew chapter 1 is in the genealogies. You ever heard that sentence before? You know what I mean by Genealogies. So and so begat so and so begat so and so begat so and so. That you know the the son of the son of the son of. And if you pay close attention to those genealogies, I know this is we you know we, we sometimes treat these like the like the safety um, you know like the, the 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 safety briefing before you take off in an airplane, right? You know this is how you use your seatbelt. Like if I couldn't figure out how to use a seatbelt, how would I even be able to get here? But anyways. It, you, that's kind of how you treat that. Well, son of, son of, son of. Okay, I read it. But if you pay attention to it, well, there's one thing that you notice is really strange. You notice that, that even though this is a listing out of the descendants, the male descendants of Jesus, there are three women listed there. First woman is a lady by the name of Tamar. And because there are children here, I won't go into the whole story, even though it's in the Bible. But let's just say that Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law, and they have children together. Okay? You understand that? Right? That, got it? Next one's a lady named Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in a Gentile city. Next woman that's listed is a woman named Ruth. Ruth wasn't even Jewish. She was a Moabitess who literally threw herself at the foot of a, an older, wealthier Jewish man so that she could fall under his protection. What is Matthew doing there? Why is he listing out these women? He's listing out these women so that when Jesus is born to a virgin, we'll look back and say, well, God's always been kind of quirky how he does things. So why should we expect anything different now? And likewise, it's here with these prophecies that Matthew gives in Matthew chapter 2. When Matthew says here, out of Egypt, I've called my son, he's, he's hearkening back to an Old Testament prophet who, who, who's talking not about, not about necessarily the Messiah coming up out of Egypt, but he's talking about the people of Israel going into exile. And he's telling them that just as you're now going into exile, I'll call you back because remember what I did in Egypt when you were slaves there? And what's, what God is telling them is he, he's telling them to remember how he worked a mighty act of salvation for them. He's calling them back to remember 
I don't know how well you know the, the Old Testament stories, but he's telling them to remember Joseph. Joseph was the youngest of Israel, of Jacob's sons. And, or the second to the youngest, actually. And, and, but he was the favorite. And God gives a dream to Joseph where he, where he basically sees his brothers bowing down to him. And Joseph, being young and wise, goes and tells his brothers, hey, guess what? You guys are going to serve me. So they do what older brothers do, which is to fake his death and sell him into slavery. And because of that, he's in Egypt to rise to the top of the kingdom of Egypt so that when there's a famine, he's in place to save the people of Israel. But even more than that, it's because he's there that the people of Israel go down into Egypt and become slaves. And it's because they're slaves that God reaches out with a mighty hand and sends plagues and judgment on the people of Egypt and delivers them in a powerful way so that they can know that they belong to the Lord God. You see, what Matthew's trying to tell us here in these prophecies is that God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. And the kingdom of God comes in ways. You can expect the kingdom of God to come in ways that you did not expect. Likewise, it is with these other prophecies that, that, that Matthew gives. The, the, the prophecy of a voice heard in Ramah weeping in loud lamentation is a prophecy about, about the northern part of the northern kingdom of Israel being conquered and brought into exile. You see, what, what he's saying there isn't that Jesus has fulfilled some kind of future telling. What he's saying is that this is the story of Israel and Jesus has now stepped into it. Everything that ever happened before now was always pointing to this moment. Even that final prophecy there where he says that he was born in Nazareth, that that, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he should be called a Nazarene. There's no Old Testament prophecy. With those words, he shall be called a Nazarene. What is Matthew saying there? That that the word nazir is the word for branch. And those Old Testament prophecies where God says that that Israel will be chopped down like a tree, but out of the stump, a branch will come out, a branch of Jesse. To reestablish the kingdom of God. What is he saying there? He's saying even the town that Jesus is born in shows us that he is the one that we've been waiting for. Even the accidental circumstance of the name of the podunk little city should serve to point us to the fact that Jesus is the branch of Jesse, the branch of the Lord. See, all of this is to say that you can expect the kingdom of God to come through unexpected ways. Our bishop has told this story before, and so some of you have heard it, but it bears being told again of a, of a, of a missionary who, who went off to far-flung lands where the gospel had not been heard, and though he prayed and sought the Lord, he was there with his family, though he served the community every day, he would open up his doors to preach the gospel, and every day only a handful of people irregularly would show up. They largely ignored the message that he brought. Over time, his son fell ill to a fever, and without access to modern medicine, he died. And as the missionary carried the coffin of his son to the graveside, and as he buried, crowds began, a crowd began to gather around the young boy's grave. And as he buried his child with tears in his face, He stood up to preach the gospel and people believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he asked afterwards why they had never come before but they came this day, he said, they told him this, they said, we never knew that the white man cried tears just like we do until now. Years afterward, he was recounting this story and someone said to him, aren't you angry that that's what it took for them to come and listen? And he said, listen to this. Isn't this exactly what it took for us to come to God? The death of his son? 
Do you see, this is how the kingdom of God works and grows. And we live in such a culture of prosperity where we equate blessing with prosperity so much so that we miss how often God works through unexpected means. Now, Herod understands something about the birth of Jesus that I fear sometimes many of us don't understand, or we don't fully get it. Herod is, is, is the, the king of Judea at this time. He's not legitimately Jewish. He's not of the line of David. He was appointed as king by the Roman government. He got there by clawing and scraping and fighting and killing and conniving his way to the top. In fact, one of the Caesars once said of Herod, it would be better to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Because of how paranoid Herod was about conspiracies. And Herod understands when he hears the news of the birth of this child in Bethlehem that here someone has come to topple him from the throne of his kingdom. You see, that, that's why Herod dispatches troops to go and kill these children. Because he's afraid that if this one grows up, then he will no longer be king. And I, and I fear for myself and for us that we oftentimes look at Christmas and we miss the reality of what has happened here. That a king has come to topple us from our own thrones. You see, I think sometimes we treat the church, we treat the gospel, we treat the message of Christmas, we treat all these things as just a little bit of sprinkling of comfort to make our lives a little bit more bearable. But what we've missed is, is that an invasion has happened. A king has come. And if he is king, then we no longer can be kings and queens of our own petty kingdoms. And so think of what it is for which you have fought and scraped and clawed and struggled and exerted yourself for and your hands are gripped on it like frozen iron. And know that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ means that that belongs no longer to you but it's his. You see, Herod understands this, and I fear that sometimes we don't. I fear sometimes we think that, 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 that this is just a, a piece of life to make the rest of it a little bit better. But the other thing that Herod doesn't understand, he gets that Jesus has come to dethrone him from his throne, but what, it, what Herod does not understand is this. He doesn't understand how Jesus has come to, to knock him off of his throne. Napoleon Bonaparte uh, is reported to have said this. He said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. You see, Herod hears that a babe has been born in Bethlehem who is to be called the king of the Jews, and the only thing he can think is that an army will form around this young child and will storm the gates of his castle to dethrone him. But what he doesn't understand is that this child will become a refugee in a foreign land, that this child will grow up in, 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 in an impoverished area to blue-collar parents that this child will be acquainted with every human woe. And it is precisely because of his humility and not because of his force that he will win people to his kingdom. It is precisely because he has come to be a servant of all that any of us pay any attention to him at all. You see, what Herod understands is that the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is built upon the covenant love of the Lord Jesus Christ. This king came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I don't know about you, but the prospect of losing control is 
unpalatable to me. I don't like the idea that I should not be in control of my family. I don't like the idea that I not, should not be in control of my finances. I don't like the idea that I should not be in control of my fate. I don't like the idea that I should not be in control of my life. But, it, but if we're honest with ourselves, then we know that control is always, only, ever an illusion. You're never in control of anything, right? I mean, if you think you are, you are heavily deceived. Think about, think about when you left your parents' home, whether that was to go to college or something else. Think about the child who had grown up in a home where their parents had controlled them for 18 years and what happened when they left that home. Out of control, right? Why? Because that control was always, only, ever an illusion. You ever see people who are working so hard to keep themselves healthy that their health is crashing? Why? Because control is always, only, ever an illusion. But what, what, what alternative do we have in a world where there's war and bankruptcy and cancer and all kinds of things that can come and rob us of what's precious? The alternative that we have is, is the one who was born to be the man of sorrows. See, if, if control, if, I, if ceding control is just so that I won't have as much misery in my life, then I'm really just, I'm really just trying to control things in a different way. Right? If I realize that the more I control my children, the less control I have over them, so I try to control them less so that I can control them, you see what's happening there? I'm still trying to control things. I need somebody else to be in control for me, don't I? And it is a terrifying to think, thing to think that the one who is in control is the one whose son prayed to him in a garden, Father, all things are possible for you. Please let this cup pass from my lips. And yet, he is a God who establishes and moves and works his kingdom in unexpected ways. I can't remember exactly where it was that I read this in Oswald Chambers. I read it years ago and it stuck with me ever since. And, and what Oswald Chambers says is this. He says, when somebody comes to me and they tell me to pray for somebody who they love, who's going through something hard, I pray that God would continue to put the pressure on that person and make it worse until he's done in them what he would do in them. Because it is better to know Christ than it is to be free from suffering. You see, that, that same God whose son prayed to him, that same father whose son prayed to him, let this cup pass from my lips, has made the cross of Jesus Christ the most glorious thing that's happened in all of human history. And people come and bow down at that cross now 2,000 years later. Because his kingdom is so wonderful that it doesn't need power or force or majesty or beauty or strength or any kind of human adornment. Strip it of everything. Nail it to a cross. Bleeding and dying. When I behold the wondrous of cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. And poor contempt on all my pride. I don't know where, where you are today. I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know where the things are sitting pretty for you or whether you're walking through hard times. But I want you to know that the God and Father of Jesus Christ, in fact, the God who became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, has been acquainted with every human woe. And he's conquered sin and death and hell and the devil. And his kingdom is growing and will one day come when he will wipe away every tear and sorrow and pain and death will be no more. You can trust him. You can give control to him. 
You can weep with him. And he will be faithful. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every pretended kingdom we own can never compare to the kingdom that you have established through your life and death and resurrection. Would you give us even now a a, a moment of clarity, a moment of insight into our own hearts and into our own lives that we would see the empty baubles, the empty trinkets that we cling to, that we would see that all that glitters is not gold, and that we would see in in your cross, through the shame of, and of the pain and the suffering, the beauty and the majesty of your kingdom. And we ask that in your name. Amen.